Hello, I'm Lutz, and I'm beginning to like the griffin. And I'm Ember, and this is our thoughts on My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Season 8, Episode 9, Non-Compete Claws. As I said, I'm beginning to like the griffin. We, or we could just let them hang there. I was joking. No, you weren't, Mr. Griffin. No, you weren't. <laughs> then, uh, hello, Season 1. I'd like you to introduce you to Season 8. Of Fall Weather Friends, I believe you might know non-compete clause. Just a little. Because of that, this episode was very meh to me. You guys have had eight seasons. Even though you're competitive by nature, you couldn't set it aside in the name of friendship. Y you would think. The best parts of this episode had to deal with the students. They were all fun. My top three favorites right now are the Earth Pony, Yuna, and whatever the Griffin's name is. <laughs> <laughs> the other good part of this episode was all of Fluttershy's expressions. Oh yeah, they were great. Especially when Spike looked at the new picture and then looked back up at the exact same pictures for every month. Also, why would he need to take another picture? To Xerox the other one. Yeah. Because it looks like that's what he did already, because they're not even slightly different poses. He startles her every month and gets that same pose. Also, I love Pinkie Pie. Like, anyone, rarity... Fluttershy, me, this potted plant. Because this was a bad idea. Unless you, Twilight, were using the entire thing to make those two work as a team. In which case you risked your students. Twilight was ready to go, you guys are idiots. Until they were like, no, we're good. And Twilight was like, I'll give you one more chance, just don't kill them. Because it's a nature walk. You should be fine. Except not. Because remember... The running of the leaves could technically be termed a nature run. And this isn't where I thought they would go with the team activity when Twilight first brought it up between the episode name and the whole thing about teamwork and being outside. I'm like, oh, we'll have sports because sports are competitive, but they're also teamwork. Mm. So that would tie back to the title and also have teamwork. And also have conflict because they'd be competing. Also, because they said field trip, I was thinking there'd be more students. Like we'd have a couple of generics in the background that got separated at some point or something. Just something to give us more variety than, I like them and everything, but the student six? It's a school. Like, are they like class 1A or something? It should have been more than just six students. I mean, you had two instructors. Two instructors could handle more than six students. And we know that there are more than six students at the school. I understand that these are the ones we want to focus on because this is the student six, but it's not realistic for a field trip. And you have a budget and all, you know, because even though we have a lot of extras now, it still takes time to animate those extras. And you still have to give them some type of generic personality to have around. But we haven't been explained that, yeah, we have these six students, but are they a class? But no, they were just introduced to the school. There is no class. There's a bunch of students going to classes, but there's no class. Because if we go and look back at the premiere, we probably saw most of these students shown in all the same classes because they were the focus. But are they on the same schedule? Kind of like schoolhouses and stuff like that in Harry Potter. That was a good excuse to only have a certain set of students that we follow around all the time. But we didn't get that with these students. They're not labeled as a class of students. So I was like, we should have more since this is a field trip. And the class sizes should be larger than six. It's usually, at least when I was young, class sizes anywhere for any, were anywhere from 15 to 20 students. And they can even be higher than that. But you would think it would be more than six. And just Applejack and Rainbow Dash. Like, I started, like, face hoofing. Right at the beginning of the episode, I was like, ooh, ooh, this isn't, ooh. And I can understand why they like Fluttershy, because two varieties of reasons. If Fluttershy is still using her assertiveness, she's probably doing it in a very polite and kind way, so students like her because she's kind. Or, if she's not using her assertiveness, students get away with a lot of stuff in her class. That's the th entire thing, is this is student voted. The students are going to pick whatever teacher they enjoy the most, not necessarily which teacher they're learning the most from. Because why vote for a teacher that challenges you 
when you can vote for one that's teaching a bird class. In other words, you fly right through it. Exactly. I learned that from Sister Act 2. I knew it before then, but okay. <laughs> I very rarely, rarely learn terms like that. I, I learned about it because of Sister Act 2. Fun movie. I enjoyed it just as much as the first, though I'm a person who also enjoyed Final Fantasy The Spirits Within. And there goes our subscription count. <laughs> I, I said I enjoyed it. Not that I think it's a good movie. <laughs> it's got issues. Ugh. I, I can enjoy a lot of stuff that's really bad. If they ever reboot uh, Mystery Science 3000 again, yes, I know there's a reboot. And you don't have to jump on me. I'm saying if they do it again, then you just get Lux. The problem is, I wouldn't have any wisecracks. I'd just sit and enjoy the movie. I don't have wisecracks until later. <laughs> uh, though I did have a couple of things I was saying as we were watching this. That was like, what, 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 huh? And then, what? I was like, one moment, what did they? And just how incredibly ineffective Rainbow Dash and Applejack are for the entirety of this episode. Yuna was drowning. You guys didn't even move. You can both swim. You didn't even move. The students both had to shapeshift and grab her and bring her up to the surface and help her to shore. And you didn't even notice that Yuna was afraid of the water. Ask her what the reason was. Apparently it's she's never learned how to swim, which makes sense in the climate she grew up in. As in climate, not as in social climate, but as in the actual climate. Because it's all snowy there. You don't learn to swim if most of your water is in ice form. Uh, that just suddenly reminded me of one of the interesting points people have brought up about the Frozen movie. of like, why are they doing ice? What, what's with ice? <laughs> Can they actually bring it down and sell it? What? Oh, harvesting ice? Yeah, that's actually a thing. Yeah, I just find it funny and it brought it back up. It's like, so do we have people like that for the X? Don't know, because the way the Yaks have been presented to us is as a very insular clan. It seems like everyone in Yak Yakistan, the entirety of Yak Yakistan seems to be that one village. That seems to be the entirety of Yak Yakistan. That seems to be like the thing with most cultures that the ponies run into. They're very insular, very like, yeah, we don't import or export anything. Which kind of makes you, so how do they work? Well, it means that they have to be completely self-sufficient. Everything they need, they're able to grow or make themselves. So I guess these nations are actually starting to get extra stuff thanks to their interactions with ponies, because I bet you there's trade going on now. Probably. But if you look at the comparative sizes of the kingdoms, it seems like ponies make up the greater portion of the population. So I would like to know what ended up making ponies the dominant species. I don't know, having a race of creatures that can shoot lightning out of their foreheads, while also having really large ones that can move the sun and the moon. Yeah, yeah, there, there is something to that, but uh, dragons can be larger and also breathe fire. Yeah, I was also trying to figure out, so these are the races. Did they ever realize that Celestia and Luna and unicorns were moving the celestial objects of the sun and moon? Or did they just go, oh, that's just going on its own. I'll one day figure out why that's happening. I'm going to plot out math problems and <laughs> create this thing called science. Oh, look, gravity. Then <laughs> later, there's magic. So, so you're doing it with like nano machines or something, right? No, no magic. Actual. Well, shoot, there goes my life. Oh, that throws all my theories out the window. So you're telling me that you move the sun and you move the moon. I thought it was gravity. Gravity? It's the thing that pulls stuff to the planet? Well, we don't know how this planet works. Maybe there's more than one sun and moon. And the sun and moon that rise and set over Equestria require unicorn alicorn magic. Your theories intrigue me. But wouldn't we have seen another sun and moon? How would we know the difference? There there would be two suns and two moons. We would see them? Uh, Equestria is how large and these other kingdoms are how small? But science. Sorry, cat girls. Come back to life. I'm sorry. Uh, th this technically isn't an anime. It should be okay. And I don't think it's a very likely theory, but so much of what we see is from a pony-centric view. 
like even going back to you know the now canonized story of the sunrise and sunset so what was happening with the other tribes and if it required unicorn magic to raise the sun and moon whoever figured that out in the dawn of time because until somebody raised it nobody could see it so how did someone find it in the first place and figure out that they needed to move it and that this would cause light yeah also here's the thing of they didn't move on their own the creatures who developed on this planet would have evolved around where the equator was because that's the only place where the temperature well not the equator but the div division between nighttime and dark there'd be a thin area of where life could actually grow because everything on the dark side would be frozen to death and everything on the light side would be cooked. Well, maybe that's how it started. There was this thin strip that could be actually be populated. And as the population grew, they needed to expand, but they couldn't go one way because it was too hot and they couldn't go the other way because it was too cold. So they moved the object that was causing the problem. Once again, I enjoy your theories, but I think we're getting off topic here. Severely, mainly because the episode was meh. <laughs> yeah, and we just think of these other things like, so, pony culture, and how did the sun, and, hmm. Because basically the students were showing teamwork the entire time. I wonder if they were just being nice at the end, because they made a big leap. Of logic, that you think the teachers actually did this on purpose. Though I do like the fact that both Applejack and Rainbow Dash went, yeah, we were just competing the entire time. I appreciate that they admitted it. Because it makes it less like that episode where Rarity got off scot-free. Still have issues with that. I'm still waiting for her to get payback for that episode. Um, speaking of Rarity, the intro made me think that, you know, we're going to have a dance episode, don't, don't you? Like a prom or something? And Rarity's going to end up making outfits or... Shanghai, some of the students into helping her or something. Some type of a dance. Rarity's going to be involved. There will be dresses. Because school dances are traditional school TV show fodder. Just think about the intro and a scene where Rarity goes, generosity, the way the shot's set up, it just made you think, you know there's going to be a dance. There's got to be a dance. A prom or something. They may not call it a dance. It may be a friendship social. Ooh, ooh, hey. <laughs> Maybe a sisterhood social at the school. But not quite sisterhoods because that would require getting everyone's sister in, assuming they all have sisters. But they're all at a friendship school. They should all have friends, so a friendship social. An excuse to party, which means it will go between Rarity and Pinkie Pie, because Pinkie Pie will just want a party cannon and balloon the whole thing, and Rarity will want dresses and punch and fancy hors d'oeuvres. Though you saying social makes me now want apple pie and ice cream. We kind of sort of have those things. Kind of, sort of, yeah. There are apple pie quest bars, and there is birthday cake flavored Halo Top. Neither of them are sponsors, but we wish they were. Because they make tasty food that we like to eat, and we would like to spend less money on it. <laughs> yes! Uh, but anything that... What did you like most about the episode? Pretty much the ending, where they admitted that they were idiots the whole time. Yeah, my favorite part was near the ending, too. Specifically, the student six getting together... And doing that. And I like the change leg. And she's like, hi. And ah! It's okay. I'm just the distraction. My only problem with that was it seemed overly complicated. Because yes, it gave each of the six something to do. I'm like, Ocellus can shapeshift into something large enough that she could just cradle Rainbow Dash and Applejack in her claws, paws, hands, whatever she transformed into. So there would be no danger of them falling into the water, which is the whole reason to scare the fish away. Because if that structure fell into the water, the fish would attack them. But we saw in the very first episode that she can transform into something large. We also saw Thorax transform into something nice and big. So we know that changelings can change into something much larger than themselves. So she could have very easily transformed cradled them in that thing in her paws, lifted them up, and then the other students could bust them out. The main reason it works to have her be a distraction and scare the fish away is in case the structure falls into the water. So that's important safety-wise. But if she's cradling the structure in its entirety... 
I also love how the students were like, we can just fly everyone across. Because once again, it was proven in the first episode. You have four flyers out of the student six. Plus you have Rainbow Dash. That's five flyers out of eight people. You could have done that all in one trip. And I do like how during the nature walk, you went, you have flyers. Go up and see where you are. And then meet to the point where the dragon goes, yeah, I'm going to see where we are. Smolder finally goes, okay, I've had it. I'm going and looking. I love how those two just kept getting fed up, especially when Applejack and Rainbow Dash switch from being argumentative to each other to being extremely polite to each other. Like, just take one of your ideas and go with it. Because you two being overly generous is not teamwork either. Because you're basically trying to one-up each other in politeness. So neither of you is willing to take charge and make a decision because you don't want to be seen in a negative light. So instead, no decisions get made and the entire thing's at a standstill. I also liked how the Earth Pony kept going, um, that's that rock. We've passed it five times. Kept pointing out the exact same rock. So yeah, all the students could tell. So apparently this is an episode about how the students are smarter than the teachers in some circumstances. So since we found the episode kind of meh, so we just go over our final thoughts about it and wrap things up for this episode? I want to jump back a little bit to Ocellus' advice to Yona about whistling, because that took me right back to a scene from The King and I very early on in the film where Anna and her son are first you know, it's very near the beginning of the movie. It's the part that you never catch when you catch it on TV. You know, and the part with the sun is kind of boring anyways because basically the entire story is about Anna and the king. After the beginning, we mostly don't see her son. But they have a whole musical number about when you're scared to whistle. So I felt like it was hearkening back to that. And the whistling also reminds me of how someone whistles when they're nervous in a scary situation. Like, hoo, 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 hoo. It was not the most masterful whistling, but we don't know if Yona's ever whistled before. Hmm. And by doing that, I suddenly remember the classic scenes where a girl goes, you know how to whistle, right? Just put your lips together and blow. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember those, but I never get the whole point of... The whole thing. I think they're trying to be overly sexual about that. Like, well, things. they are because you see the girl purse her lips and go, blow. Ah. And the guys are all like, ha, da, 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 da. <laughs> uh, I'm also laughing because I suddenly remember seeing from Goonies. But moving on. Oh, see, I was thinking Tiny Toons. Ah! Because Babs does that at one of the dances. Another good show. I'm... Just can't wait to see what they do with the reboot of Animaniacs. Because they got everyone back, from what I understand. I don't know about the voice actors, but I know they got all the crew that did all the writing. But I know all the voice actors are still around. So that's good. And now back to ponies and other creatures. I was just about to do a say way of like, they needed to just have brain recently. <laughs> <laughs> I like how everyone was using the word creatures too. Everyone kept referring to other people, the other sets as, oh yeah, you creatures or us creatures or... Because they were stumbling over it in the first episode, you know, because it was a new thing for them because pony culture is very pony centric, even though they focus on, hey, we got the three tribes together and we all get along. You're still all technically ponies because you can interbreed and those offspring can have offspring, which means it's not a one off like a liger or a mule. And even then where we have interesting Stuff where we do have actually ligers and mules that have actually bred and created other. So I'm like, interesting. Well, nature will usually try to find a way. Yep. Genetics. But I'm saying on a consistent basis, pony intermarriages tend to result in offspring when they're from different tribes. Yes, all the tribes are united, but you're all united under the banner of ponies. So in their own way, the ponies seem to be as... Insular and isolated as all the other tribes. Hmm. Because you don't exactly see, other than Spike, a lot of other sentient species living in pony predominant communities. Hmm. That's a very good point. My brain started playing around with all ideas. Also, going back over to like, so 
Where did Spike's egg come from? How was Spike's egg obtained? And is that just something we're supposed to kind of gloss over because of the fact that the Dragon Kingdom is a thing now? Also, when is greed going to become a problem for Smolder? <laughs> because she's from a culture where she was raised as a dragon. So do they do things to control the greed too? Or because there's some pretty large dragons over there. Then are they large because of the greed and or is this another thing we're supposed to ignore as a one off because it was during the first season because a lot of stuff in the first season has been contradicted later improved upon. Yes, but contradicted It's like it makes more sense with the new version of it. But I'm like yeah. the first stuff still happened. This is why it's very helpful if possible to have your story all mapped out in advance because continuity. But when this started, they had no idea how long the show was gonna go on. Writing staff change, creators change, anytime you have a collaborative effort. And then, you know, even with a single author, they go back and change things, Mr. E.E. E. Knight. Though, he had a good reason. He felt bad for the character because of the stuff he wrote. Hey, you can feel for your characters. I feel for mine all the time. I get that, but I'm like, you chose to write these things. So until it was published, you had the option to rewrite the third book and not have things go that far. It's only canon if the public sees it. But now it's canon and books one and three contradict each other. Well, should we go back to this episode and finish things up? Yes, it was just a fun tangent. It was. It, our tangents are always fun. And I, just to clarify, I enjoy his books, and I did get the opportunity to ask that point blank at um, an author event, and it was awesome. Yes, it was. He's a very good author and a very nice person. Okay, so I just found this episode so middle of the road, so meh. There weren't really any strong highlights for me. I really like the Student Six. And I'm starting to really enjoy the Griffin because of just this personality of like, what? I mean, I'm a, gri I'm a Griffin. I wouldn't do that for another Griffin. So <laughs> I'm at the school to learn friendship. See, I'm not there yet. I know I'm not there yet. Which just made him such a fun character to enjoy. And then there's Yuna. I love her because she's awesome. She's a big girl with lots of muscle. She could kick my tail. She's awesome. I also loved how much she liked smashing the sticks because we saw that as a Yak Yakistan thing. Thank you. I was wondering why that was familiar to me. Because it was a Yak Yakistan thing. And for a moment there, uh, going back to the smashing the sticks reminded me of the bridges. And I'm like, together, sticks and vines. But the sticks were small and the vines were short. Both the piles that they were making, I'm like, you want bigger sticks than that. AJ, you want to get longer vines than that. Here's the thing. Still together, they would have been a whole lot more structurally sound. Because you could use the vines to tie the sticks together and make a support structure. Which is where I thought they were going to go with this. That the students would just start building another bridge the, air quotes, correct way. Or they would have just like flown everyone across and went, what's taking you two so long? Which is also what I was expecting, because the students were very impatient by this point. So, while the teachers were working on the bridge, if I was a flyer, I would have just gone, okay, let's go, and flown across, and then yelled at the teachers in the middle of the ravine, are you guys coming? <laughs> uh, or just gone back and picked them up. So, outro. Outro. And this has been our thoughts on... Applejack and Rainbow Dash being stupid. I mean, My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Season 8, Episode 9, Non-Compete Clause. Also, there was no clause because there was never a contract. Exactly. Hey, thanks for listening. Wow, you guys made it to the outro again? That's pretty awesome. So, you've heard most of this before, but well, I guess it bears repeating. Uh, we have lots of content. Before you leave this video, you can like, share, subscribe if you haven't already. Comment. Comments are fun. Yes, we get a little behind on answering sometimes, but we still read them even if we don't always answer in a timely fashion. I love all of your comments. They're wonderful. <laughs> even the novels. We love you, man.
and then you can watch other videos. Also, we have links to see more of Lux's art. Also, we probably put some referral links in there. You can like grab the episode or some pony themed merchandise or something. So all of that is very supportive, you know, clicks, views, likes, comments, all very awesome. If you're a purse or wallet or um, cell phone payment app is handy, we do also accept money, not required, but accepted. We have both Patreon and Coffee. Patreon, if you're not familiar with, is a monthly subscription. You do get an opportunity to review before it's charged each month. So totally can cancel. Starts out at a dollar. Right now, Lux offers monthly sketches with uh, voting at that price. So cheapest commission ever. And coffee is no commitment, but higher starting price. It works in increments of three. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We appreciate all of the support that we receive in the form of views, likes, comments, dialogue, suggestions, and of course, financially as well. But all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.